So welcome everybody to the, the third installment of Beavers Build Together. Um, this uh, top today's topic is about instruction. And so Lisa and I thought we would kick this off. And, and uh, just to let you guys know, uh, Academic Senate President Lisa Shubb is the brains behind the operation. A couple of weeks ago, we were like, what are we gonna do? And uh, she brilliantly said, well, why don't we kick it off with the education master plan that we approved a couple of years ago as the starting point because we were looking into the future and uh, we've kind of had a uh, uh, crash course in the future over the past year plus. So wanted to um, open it up to Lisa for her opening remarks because she was the brains behind this workshop. Right. Well, so the educational master plan at the time when we were reading through and, and, and approving it, it was this, like Frank said, it was this look into the future. Uh, and uh, it was almost a scary kind of future, right? What it, This future where uh, things are going to be different and students are going to be wanting to access their, their course materials in different ways. And then you know, COVID-19 pandemic hits and it's like, boom, we're in that future. Uh, so by going, kind of reminding us of what we plan for, uh, it, it, it just, it shows you how much what we're doing right now really dovetails into what we had been planning for. Uh, so we're hoping that through this presentation, as we're uh, going back through that educational master plan, that uh, all of you will be thinking about what it is, what is it that you're doing right now that kind of aligns with this plan of this thinking? And what do you think we should be doing going forward. Uh, and, and as we go through, put these ideas in the chat, and then we can also talk about them a little bit more deeply when we've reminded ourselves what our plans uh, in the educational master plan were. Thanks, Lisa. So everyone read the uh, nearly 50 plus pages of the education master plan. So we have a great starting point. And everyone attended uh, all of the presentations that uh, Gary, Aguilar, Gary Aguilar and I did um, when uh, Gary was Academic Senate President. But just in case, what we did was we back, went back into the archives and we actually found the, uh, the old PowerPoint and uh, we thought that that would, one, make it a little easier for Lisa and I. And two, it would be a great starting point for this conversation. If I may, I'm gonna share a screen. So we're not going to spend an inordinate amount of time going over the slides, but we wanted as a refresher uh, to kind of um, well, to walk you through the education master plan. So we can't uh, start without the acknowledgement of the project team. Uh, so Gary and his role as Senate president, um, amazing team of faculty, staff and administrators who came together over the course of a year. To, to work on the education master plan. Uh, special kudos to Joshua Harris, who is our student, um, who contributed uh, quite a bit to the thinking behind this. Uh, remember that our education master plan wasn't the traditional master plan. Typically master plans are a bunch of numbers. They look at enrollment data, kind of think about uh, each department and um, then it sits on a shelf. What we intended to do was create a compass for the institution moving forward uh, over the, the next several decades. And, and so we use the analogy of a compass. And now um, the, the, the how we wrote the plan was based on imperatives, uh, this concept of these key priorities that we'll be focusing on. And um, we, we essentially had a um, called something out, an issue, and then we, we uh, had a response to that as a college. So um, I'm gonna quickly walk you through the imperatives and it's fascinating as we were going through this um, that there's so much that we were thinking about and so much that we've learned over the past year plus during COVID times. And clearly uh, as an institution, we've committed to really looking at our DI populations. And I think that, that that is a clear theme that we've held true to. As we look at imperative two, um, as we think about these rapid technological advances, this is where it gets eerie as, as we were kind of speculating what might happen. 
of uh, if if you remember the uh, presentation that we did, uh, you know, two years ago, there was this video of a dog. It, it was a robot dog, and it real it had the um, ability to do all the work in the manufacturing plants. And if you think about where we are now in terms of the workforce and the rapid change we've had in the workforce, um, we were talking about things like uh, the potential of some jobs changing significantly because of uh, the advances in technology. Well, I'm pretty sure that happened over the past year and it was forced. But these are the things that we were thinking about um, and, and need to continue to think about as things evolve. The third imperative was integrating essential skills. And there was a core component to the liberal education that I think is uh, was important then, uh, but more important now is as we think about critical thinking and um, a, a enlightened and aware society. And these are things that we really, we, we grappled with the CTE factor uh, that is a heavy balance in at our college combined with the need to provide students with this holistic education and something that as a team we grappled with and as a college, we will continue to. Uh, the before. Increase, oh. oh, I just wanted to underscore the increasingly resilient students. I mean, that was just so powerful that we were thinking about that back then and think about where we are right now in terms of that resilience and the resilience that all of us have had to you know, to to bring out in ourselves and and in our students. Thanks, Lisa. And then the fourth one was tailoring experiences to students. We you know we have uh, faculty like Randy who with the Design Hub is is doing exactly this. Um, and then also the other critical many critical points to this, but our different student demographic thinking about age that uh, within the district and within the state. Our student numbers are different and they skew older given the reentry students that we have, the older students that we have coming back um, uh, for retraining and upskilling. Um, Elisa, any thoughts on this one? Right. I mean, we, we were thinking about the, the different demographics of our students, but also now when we're thinking about like the way we've conducted our instruction to fit students' lives that have been impacted by COVID, their work schedules, this idea of making things more available to students asynchronously um, in order to fit their coursework into their lives as opposed to that you know regularly we had been focusing most of our attention on having our students come to us and now we're having to do a little bit more of coming to you know us coming to our students um, and not fitting that model the fifth imperative speaks to our our local employers or regional employers and, and the connection we have to them. I think that Grant Gould would hammer me on this one. What are we doing to keep up our connections with our employers and our partners? I think that uh, it's ever more important as the workforce shifts and uh, needing to stay current with those shifts. Lisa? Go, go ahead. Okay. Uh, the sixth one uh, was stimulating uh, exemplary teaching and learning, and uh, I think that the, the key component of this was ensuring that we are providing the professional development to support our faculty uh, and, and to allow faculty to continue to, to work uh, at teaching and learning. Right, and so many, so much of this, we've had to learn technology, uh, but also I hear so many from so many of us uh, faculty that uh, in order to be effective using new technologies, we also have to think a lot more about how our students learn um, and what to the way in which to use tools. We focus a lot on how to use the tools. You know, there wasn't too long ago that I know that I had to just figure out how to get on Zoom, right? Uh, so that that was the first thing and then it became how can we learn maybe on zoom uh, and then just discovering more about the way in which uh, our students are learning you know the physical campus is the one that strikes me um, uh, with an exclamation mark i think the the question isn't necessarily how will things change but really the the question that has emerged is who has access, right? Who has access to technology um, at a distance? Who has 
the access to quiet, steady space. I think that that shift of the physical campus has happened, obviously, with our inability to access the campus, but then the, the need for our campus ultimately to be that space for students um, it, it, to provide technology, to provide access, the quiet space. It's been fascinating and painful to, to see uh, the what the campus has meant to our students um, and will mean uh, in the future. And then the um, this is uh, we should actually dub this the the Randy Schuster shark slide. This is achieving operational effectiveness and uh, clunky is is the best way to that we came up with. To, there's other words that you could probably come up with to describe many of the systems that we have. Uh, I won't even go into detail because you all know what our what our uh, uh, that that we need to get better at achieving operational effectiveness. But we got forms online, so you know that was <laughs> a little bit less clunky. Uh, financial stability. Uh, I think that as we um, get uh, many many issues at play, uh, the Funding formula changes, our decrease in enrollment, uh, a need to uh, find other sources of revenue. I think that, uh, that this is certainly a, a highlight issue as well. And then as we look at collaboration, I think we were very cognizant of the, the need to not only collaborate within the college, but within the district and within the region. Uh, it, it's becoming very clear and statewide also. I, I, I think that these are um, uh, pressing issues that, that we continue to grapple with. I think this is also one of, been one of the hardest things for us to do because we have been disconnected from one another in so many ways being remote. Um, I, I've seen and heard so much at, you know, necessity to collaborate. I think we maybe are finding new ways because like we're all here together on a Friday morning that we might not have previously gone to this kind of uh, a, a event together uh, if it had meant driving into the campus. So utilizing the technologies and some of the new skills that we have to uh, develop more opportunities for collaboration. I think that's it. We were uh, we wanted to make sure the education master plan didn't sit on a shelf, and uh, we <laughs> we uh, took it off the shelf for this conversation. So there you have it. Uh, what do you guys think? And I'm totally okay with uh, uh, 45 minutes of awkward silence with 35 of my closest friends. <laughs> so we, we have well, we we have comments in the um, in the chat, and I, rather than me just kind of going over them, let's go ahead and and so Allie. Yeah, yeah I was just gonna say that um, uh, I do have fears that the, the pendulum is gonna swing too far and that we're gonna get away from meeting the needs of students who really do crave and need seat time. They, they need to be back on campus to be as successful as they could be. And of course, I'm not suggesting that we wouldn't offer any online courses, um, but I do think we need to, you know, departments need to carefully think about which of their courses and how many of their courses are offered just as successfully online as they are on campus. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add in into that kind of doubling down on finding institutionally speaking, finding better ways to to query our students to find out what they are looking for, what they need. Uh, there's a lot, at, like Ali, you really know, you, you point out that there's a lot of instructors who know what their students need because in the, within the context of a classroom, you know, or a class experience, students are telling you 
right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it also institutionally finding out from our students what services they're looking for on, on campus, what classes they want to uh, take on, what, uh, you know, what ex parts of the experience really they would prefer to have as on ground. So if, if I could jump in, Frank, we had a conversation when we were looking at that classroom redesign that I showed that that goes to the um, clunky administration portion of this. And we can have all sorts of great ideas, but if we can't describe what we're offering to our students. So the example was this high flex model. And well, online, all we can put down in people's sauce is synchronous or asynchronous. There's, there's no way to describe anything that's flexible, anything that's new. And so I think that that'll be a key thing is, is how do we, you know, it's great to have all this information from the students, but if we can't explain to them what we want to do, it's, it's, and, and they don't, half the time they don't read the stuff anyway, right? So we understand <laughs> that. Um, but partly that's because our presentation of what we offer is back at that clunky stage. And so perhaps that's uh, an area that could maybe move up. We, we kind of tend to put that lower on the level and maybe that needs to move up in importance that we unclunkify how we talk with our students. That's a really great point, Randy. I think that it's from a conceptual, I, I think we're ahead of both the concept and the, the actual execution but we're behind on the mechanics, if that makes sense. So to use uh, Professor Schuster ex as the example, he's got Design Hub and he's got a concept. He's been doing this. So he's been doing high flex. Uh, so from a concept standpoint and practical standpoint, we have a classroom model. He's got kind of the thinking of, okay, I can teach this both synchronously and asynchronously. Um, there are students who at a certain time might be able to, to watch the video and su students who would be physically on campus and then students who asynchronously would do this. Um, and I'm not going to get into the details because it gets pretty complicated really quick, but both from a concept standpoint, we can do it from a classroom standpoint, equipment standpoint we can in this one isolated area. I'm not saying that I've kind of, I've done video capture in every single classroom. It's gonna take a long time, but for this one classroom, we could pull it off. Now the mechanical part is where it trips us up. To Randy's point for, with our um, California Community College attendance accounting, how is it accounted for, uh, right? And so there's the apportionment perspective, which the chancellor's office, like they haven't thought about this, nor do they have kind of the rules and regs for this. and then. So there's that whole attendance accounting component. Uh, then there's also the systems piece, which Randy alluded to of, well, how do we, co we, we can code it synchronous or asynchronous online face. It's, it's all of them. There's not a button, <laughs> like the system would like break if we clicked all five buttons and said, yeah, it's all of them. And somehow it works out. I, I think that those are the things that certainly trip us up but the concept and idea is, is all in place. It's, it's how, do we, how do we kind of build the system around it to make it work? Uh, very good points. Elisa, I think, I think you're the official moderator. <laughs> you're, you're, you're better at that than me. <laughs> Allie had her hand up again and then Katarina has something to say. <laughs> Yeah, to, to an even more basic comment, like Randy's talking about a class that one class that fits all of those descriptions, but even making sure that first time students understand if the class is, even if it's fully synchronous or fully asynchronous or, or in person, you know, ESL students aside, I think there are a lot of other first time college students that when they look at the schedule, they don't know what they're signing up for. They just, they don't know how to read that. And we've got a, a great um, IA in the ESL center who made like a little presentation to try to help ESL students to show them what the different parts of the online schedule means. But even though I've shared that with my current students who are already in the system, they're still having some trouble understanding, well, do we have Zoom meetings or not? 
And is this class going to be only on campus or is it going to have some online? So that's like a huge, huge thing that I don't have specific suggestions for, to be quite honest. But yeah, that's just a big thing to, to help students understand what they're getting into. Right. Instead of waiting until you're enrolled and then you get on, you get on the canvas page and you're like, oh, uh, that's yeah. not what I we almost need, like, you know, bright, shiny brochures or like on a, you know, like when you're shopping on Amazon and you can check out the product before you buy it, you know, yeah. something like that for our students. Mm -hmm. Katerina. Oh, hi. My comment actually was very similar to what Ali just said and following up with, with Randy's point. Just that, um, I mean, you said it so well, but we really do have to ensure that the students understand the implications of their choices. And I think that we also have to take some responsibility for that and not just put it on the student. Um, oh, you made a mistake when you signed up for your Zoom class. You know, I, I worry about that because we could lose students from that. So anyway, I'm just reiterating Ali and, and Randy, thanks. Great. John has a comment in chat, and so he, but he's restricted with the noise. So, would you like me to summarize? Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, saying that uh, I think it will be imperative as students return to classrooms for faculty to add interactive value to the lecture environment more than previously. Um, because the classroom experience needs to be more than just watching a live video in person, right? So there just needs to be a reason for um, students to, to actually be on campus, like with Q&A, clickers, small group activities, uh, really interactive pieces. And that'll, I think, yeah, I appreciate hear, hearing that, John. Right, that idea of really flipping the classrooms or, or making it, you know, adding the value. Like, what is the value for you to actually drive to campus, park your car, walk into a building, but, you know, it, it, interact with people live? Like, what, uh, what, what makes that piece uh, valuable for the students? Right, and building community and, and relationships that you can do and making that a piece of what we're doing it, and the environment. Well, I teach communication, but you know, the environment just becomes uh, so important. What, what environment, what space are we in? Are we, if we're in, uh, if we're in a shared space, be it Zoom, you know, it, uh, remote or be it physical, what are we bringing to that environment? How are we cultivating those environments uh, to be places that our students want to be in those places where our students can thrive? Right, and instructors need to answer answer these questions for them for them for themselves in terms of their instruction let me pose a two-part question to you guys um i've been thinking about this so i'll, I'll try to make it simple uh, what so we've been teaching online for a year plus now and surviving what are things that you would hang on to when we go back face to face that you realize this is great, want to hang on. And what are things that are absolutely missing that we need when we re return? And I've heard strands of this, like relationships and, uh, being, but I'm curious, you've been living this for a year plus. What are things that, that you've realized that, that you've, you've never done before that you want to keep? And what are things that you need and are lacking um, once we return. So I'll 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 jump in because I love to do that. Uh, <laughs> um, well, and and I'm going to give a shout out to our IT department. So uh, teaching AutoCAD, Revit, all these kind of power computer programs that almost no students have a computer that's capable of using. They've done the virtual machine wear, and now they're even going past sharing our computer to having it vir literally virtual. It's, it's a, a, on a big server somewhere and people log in. And um, what I see 
for us that we have to keep is is that we need that in our classrooms that so that the tech that they can get at home over our VMware is exactly what we're teaching with on campus. And so that evens the playing field between many of these different things. For, and this is just in my area, right? The types of things that I'm teaching really, really work for that. And then the other thing that uh, I would love to keep is, and, and again, this is, it's, I'm, I'm lucky because the Design Hub students bail me out all the time. I'll do a lecture that doesn't really make much sense because it wanders around and I hand it to one of them and I've got a 15 minute synopsis of this rambling one hour lecture that I did. And, and it's from the student's point of view, right? Of, oh, there, that, that, that. And, and I'm going to keep that. And, and we really, um, the student help in the classroom to remanage or recapsulize what we, what we go over, kind of like the cliff notes, automatic cliff notes is really a cool thing. And, and so I think that that's really important for us to be able to keep, even for people that did suffer through my one hour lecture, they want to go back and get the, the nice clear version of it. I did see a hand up a minute ago. Um, Shimona, did you want to? I was going to say something, but I, I'm listening and I think that this is probably, I mean, it's more from a classified perspective on what I think, not really the instructional like faculty. Um, so I kind of I put my hand down for that. But since I'm talking, I might as well say something now, like at this point. Um, all right, I'm already in. Um, what I was going to say is um, the things that, um, from my perspective, that I would keep is um, now that we're like putting more things online, um, once we go back to campus, I think that needs to be more uh, a more clear process for the students because I get a lot of phone calls of, um, and they're, you know, like, they're confused. So a little bit more clear process. I don't know if, it, if that's coming from like, where do I find my petition? I mean, it's simple stuff. Um, how do I find this faculty member? I'm reaching out to this person and I can't, this department, like they need to have more uh, of a clear understanding. And in my mind, that looks like more, more staff trained on ground to be able to, uh, walk the students through the process, but I'm sure that's happening in student services. Well, I'm hope, I would like to think it is um, happening in student services, but I see a lot of confusion for the students on what class or how do I get into contact with the faculty? Just like they need a clearer process. They're really confused uh, a lot of the time and um, a centralized process, I guess. That's what I was gonna say, but that's not, uh, yeah, that's it, I'm done. That's really helpful, thank you. Camille? Hi, thank you. Um, I have noticed one of the things that is a great advantage is Zoom office hours. Um, so when we are allowed to go back, I'd like to do a combination of meeting students on campus, but then also it's very flexible for us to meet them at other times. And so I remember I used to have like moms come with their kids after they picked them up from school, uh, rush over during their lunch break. At, so there'll be no more of that. We can, we can take advantage of uh, technology to meet them where they're at. I also um, have appreciated taking the AQ series that Grant Gould has introduced. And um, one of the big encouragements of that uh, program is to offer students frequent low stakes assessments. Uh, so there's opportunity to get feedback and then revise. And so that's really impacted how I teach instead of like working towards one big paper in history, even though previously it was scaffolded. I think that's still intimidating to students. And I was very apprehensive to assign something like that during a pandemic. Uh, and so I'd like to continue with um, that way of 
creating assignments and um, evaluating students. Uh, and then a very uh, serious need that I think should be changed. I can't speak for all departments, but certainly for the history department is that with this emphasis upon active learning, um, understanding who our students are, being very flexible, providing them with individualized uh, accommodations as needed, um, like we want to do, it's unreasonable to have 45 students in our class. Um, when I look at my Canvas page, it, at least it's alphabetized, but there's just way too many scrolls. Uh, to, to get to all of the students. And um, when we think about being back in person, uh, doing active learning, uh, I remember like in Davies 105, I couldn't get around the room without saying, excuse me, could you stand up? Could you scooch? I mean, it's, it was like a huge endeavor just to get to the back of the room if I was having students work in groups. And so both physically and as well as if we're really serious about understanding our students' needs, and being able to meet those needs on an individual basis, we've, we've got to take a hard look at 45 students in some of our classes. Um, Sac City and Folsom Lake have their history courses capped at 40. We teach some of the same courses. And so students who enroll at those colleges are able to get a little more individualized attention from their instructors than our students at ARC. So. Th those are my comments. Thanks, Camille. I see in the chat also, Teresa, would you like to speak to, um, or give you a second, or I'll just say that Teresa would like to hang on to the demonstration videos that she's made for Canvas. Um, by showing techniques in class that students will uh, be able to access over and over again at their convenience. Now, Lisa, in a, um, in a semester, we might like fillet a salmon three or four times, but, and that is actually a skill that like salmon is probably the most, one of the most popular fishes you'll see out in the restaurant industry. And for them to be able to see that video and really watch all the nuances of filleting a salmon, I think that's, that's something that's, that's wonderful that's come of this. And then as far as part two of Frank's question, um, getting back on campus, just really looking forward to having the physical space for home base and getting the word out to the students what home base really has to offer. Um, I think that that is something that we could really push when we get back on campus. That was it. <laughs> hey. And John, are you able to talk? Great. Yeah, I, I couldn't stay out of the conversation. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll echo Camille just in regards to something as simple as office hours. That's obviously we had the ability before the pandemic, but people didn't bother learning how to use it and so forth. And, but, you know, for me, I just think, what, is it, what does it mean to be in a classroom now? If, if somebody's, you know, I, I know a lot of us are moving away from straight you know, hour and 20 minute lectures or whatever, but, you know, there's plenty of people who that was what they did. And, um, you know, I try to make an experience of being in a lecture interactive, um, but, you know, I, moving to completely remote asynchronous, you know, one of the classic things you use is the discussion. So everybody has to chime in about what they got from a particular module or lesson. And um, in fact, I was talking with Frank the other day and just saying how it, it is phenomenal the things I've learned that students take note of or are surprised by, or, you know, I, like I've been teaching for 25 years and I had no idea students saw, took away certain things from this experience. And, and so that has been a, you know, a joy for me. But if we go back into the classroom, I don't want to keep grading, you know, a kajillion discussion comments. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, there has to be, I got to, you know, figure out what that balance is. But yeah, it has to mean something for students to come to campus. Um, and you know, it's incumbent upon everybody to make those classroom experiences mean something. And, and also, yeah, Teresa, just little instructional videos that would completely cover something that doesn't really need to be discussed in class. That's kind of the flipped classroom approach. Um, you know, hopefully people can take some of the resources they've created 
and just assign that as an outside thing and do something more dynamic and interesting inside the classroom. So yeah, that's that's my takeaway. Um, <clears throat> hi, everyone. I was going to share something very similar to what Randy was saying. Um, over in Business and Computer Science, we have our own computer lab um, because, um, like design, we have some very specialized programs that our students are working on, software that our students are working on. And so we've had to virtualize all of that, or at least find a way for students to be able to access um, that resource. And one of the things that we've been working on is how do we continue to make that resource available to students, even when we're back on, on ground, um, so that students don't have to physically come to the computer lab to be able to, to have that access that will, they will still be able to have um, to access all of those the resources that they would have if they came physically to the lab and still be able to do that remotely. So that goes to another point, Frank, that maybe you can talk about is um, we have lots of cool ideas about how we could become more efficient by combining lab times with different courses and things like that, but it never seems to fit with how we account for our times. And so I think that's that's actually a really important thing for us to be able to look at if if we have you know, uh, 20 spots in a lab and five of them are filled up with somebody from Design 100 and five are filled up with somebody from 325 and somebody from 350. And the, the person who's running the lab, basically just because of the nature of the beast, knows how to do all of those things. How do you apportion those out? And that's always something we struggle with. We could really become more effective and more efficient if we had some way of apportioning times mm -hmm. in, in, in a way that, that worked for the district and worked for the professors and worked for the students. So I think that's another place where potentially we have an opportunity to make some sort of headway. How do we account for time uh, maybe in a different fashion than what we've always accounted for time in those three areas. I'll try to respond to that, Randy, but it's a really complicated question because it, one, Randy does some really cool and weird stuff. Like it, it, it comes hand in hand, like it's awesome, but as you all know, it doesn't fit the box sometimes. So this is one where you have kind of team teaching, you have kind of, it's splitting load. It's a hard one, but the parallel really is the earlier part of the conversation about the asynchronous synchronous, synchronous uh, uh, model, how, how that works. So just if, if we take that logic a little further, think about the from a um, enrollment management standpoint. So let's say that, uh, who am I gonna pick on? I'm gonna pick on Elisa. Elisa with her 28 cap uh, speech class. She's got 28 students usually. They either are fully online or face to face, but let's say she goes high flex. So then that means that we have students who choose. And so the very simplistic way of doing it to beat the system is to make it uh, an asynchronous class. And then you kind of create activities which are optional for students. That way we can kind of track all the students and it's clean. But the real way we, I, I think from a, a practical standpoint, a reality standpoint for students. Students want to choose, right? So students want to know, okay, am I going to be kind of just a, a, a student who uh, who participates at 2 a.m.? I'm at, and we've all learned about asynchronous synchronous we, we, over the past year because we've been forced to, but so that students, a typical asynchronous students, student, it gets harder then uh, if you think about this high flex model, well, then Elisa's going to have, she's going to go to class every day on Tuesday, Thursday from 9 a.m. to 1020. Um, I think the contact hours work out. So, so she goes there and then she has a video and she's got of the 28 students, let's say five, I'm going to make it easy. Eight are asynchronous. They're showing up at 2 a.m. whenever they're doing it on their own. Then she's got 10 students who actually physically show up in class. You've got 10 of them. And, and she's interacting with them. 
then she's got 10 students who are synchronous online and they kind of log in at that exact time. Now that kind of makes sense to me. It's like, cool, because you give students the most flexibility, but then we go back to the systems piece. Like then does that mean that I create three separate sections for Elisa? Um, and it kind of gets to Randy's load question of are they then how does the load work on that? I guess like one class has 0.2 and then the other classes are zero loaded, but then uh, one class has a cap of 10, the other has a cap of 10, the other ha has a clap, cap of eight. And then we've sort of worked it out conceptually, but then that would totally break people soft, I think. So, and then the chancellor's office would be like, what are you guys doing? Like, we don't understand. So those are kind of the mechanical pieces that I've been trying to think through of how this would actually work. But then at scale, then I've got like, instead of having one section of speech, I've got like three sections times 30. So it just like <laughs> magnified the kind of, and that's one apartment. So that's kind of the mechanical piece that I, we need to figure out. And I, I think as a, like conceptually from the instructor point of view, it might be more realistic for, for those of us who, whose brains just exploded thinking about all of that. Um, it might be more realistic for us to think, okay, what would it, what, how would this model I saw in the chat, it might just have been to me about how, you know, in, in secondary school, some kids are in the classroom and some kids are synchronously not in the classroom and they're all interacting together. So that might be one piece that as uh, instructors we think about, like would that work? Would that model work with some students zooming into your physical classroom while you are physically there with students? Because in some cases that might work and then in other cases might be like, oh, that might be, you know, well, there's technology, right? And then another piece to think about is, are there ways for us to allow asynchronous options for the students who cannot make all of the classes meeting times, some of the class meeting times? So what do we, how do we engage out, you know, do we, do we have a discussion inside of a, uh, in class time that extends out onto the discussion boards? Is it possible to give the students who did not attend that class discussion uh, a, a matching opportunity in the asynchronous form of the discussion boards. So these are the kinds of like ins the instructional questions that we can ask ourselves um, as we demand that Frank figure out how to make it work <laughs> and then how to communicate it as Randy pointed out to our students. So our students know uh, what they would be getting into uh, when they sign up before they sign up uh, for the class. Right, and then there's a comment in the in the chat here about that sounds like a lot of work. Jan, does that a good summary? Yeah. Let's see other comments in the chat. So folks have um, maintaining resources uh, for students like having the Chromebooks hotspots. Um, and I know that that was uh, some things that were mentioned before about uh, providing students access on campus and off of campus uh, with the technology. So if I may pose a, another question, uh, just curious. Uh, what, as teachers, have you learned something new about our students during this past year plus that you, many of you are, are veteran teachers who've been in the classroom for a long time, but is there anything that you've learned that's, that's new about your students or epiphanies? I'll, I'll share that I think one of the things for me is seeing students because I teach my classes, I have a synchronous component to my classes in communication, speech and communication. Seeing my students in their spaces has just been 
uh, it, it's been very eye-opening and it's been very uh, equalizing. I, I realized that how much that being, even though I don't lecture that much in on ground, but just being the, the one person standing, the one person dressed like a professor, the one person you know leading the class and that power uh, dynamic there. Uh, on In the Zoom, it, it's so, it, it's, I see my students more in the, like as whole people and they're seeing me as being the same size square um, that they are. And, um, you know, I, even on the first day, I have to remember to put Professor Elisa Shep, otherwise they won't know who I am um, in, in, the, in the session. So uh, for me, that, that equalizing and that humanizing and, and the whole person uh, recognition with my students has been very, uh, very enjoyably eye-opening. And we have comments in the chat here that I'll just summarize and feel free to feel, jump in about how uh, students are really, really motivated to get in education. They're working very, very hard to adjust uh, that students, we, we admire our students and they're pushing through and that everybody has a struggle uh, and story. Uh, and that when we practice assuming the best and not the worst, uh, that, that works better. Uh, that Randy has discovered that he thinks a penguin would probably be less intimidating. So how we show up, right? How we show up on, on to, for our students, something to reflect on. Uh, the students like the flexibility to learn at their own pace, uh, but they do miss the hands-on experience of working in a science lab. Um, they feel handicapped uh, in the concern about whether they will have the, the skills uh, ready to transfer, uh, that no one size fits all. jump in. I don't mean to just read your words, but I don't know. If, one thing I found out is that um, not everybody is uh, in a space to, that is conducive to doing the kind of work uh, that we might need, need to, to do. And that extends for uh, my, my colleagues as well. We, we can't always be present in the way that we might be expected or hope for. <laughs> and it's I, difficult to sit in the back of the class at a Zoom meeting. <laughs> um, I was just going to jump in and say that um, I, I've been, you know, early on really committed to just doing this asynchronously, feeling like that gave students just in my environment the most flexibility under difficult circumstances. But, but man, that the times that I've, you know, and I've tried to struggle with building in ways to, to you know, to get them face to face, the office hours. But, you know, it's, it's um, you don't get many people dropping in for just plain old office hours, but the, they need, regardless of what I thought about asynchronous, they, they need that connection. They benefit from that connection and they benefit, uh, for, I've been talking with other faculty about how they basically force meetings, um, you know, little group office hours show up here. Um, they, they benefit even if, <laughs> uh, even if um, they don't think they do, uh, they, I've had some incredibly rich discussions with students about life and how things are going and school and so forth that I don't, I'm not sure I, I ever would have had in a, in a, in an in-person environment. Um, and, and yeah, the equal, I, I hadn't even thought of it the way that you described it, uh, at least, to, but the equalizer of, <laughs> of Zoom or of that, you know, you're just one little tile and, uh, or your cat runs through the image, that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, you know, sil silver linings of interesting things we've learned in a difficult situation. Yeah, Camille? Yeah, well, I, I think that others have um, shared my sentiment. There is a quote attributed to Eleanor Roosevelt. I don't know for sure if she said it, but it comes on tea bags a lot. Um, the woman is like a tea bag. You never know how strong she is until she's put in hot water. I feel like I, I knew that our students had struggles, but I didn't have as um, intimate knowledge of the struggles that many of them are experiencing uh, and, until I meet with them more one-on-one -on -one, uh, through Zoom. 
uh, they feel like open themselves up more to you uh, than they, you know, it would be a few students maybe who would come to office hours and share the depth of um, the challenges they're facing. But given that, um, I am just humbled by the resilience of our students and their dedication. And they are working all over our community. Um, I mean, I sometimes I'm asked to meet at strange times, but they're in their car because they're just getting off a shift. Maybe they had to work two shifts so that we're talking 16 hours, and yet they still want to talk about, okay, so how do I get that historical reflection done uh, in, in those circumstances? Like, that definitely is something that has changed for me in a very significant way. Um, and the other thing for me is uh, I also see that our students are um, coming from a real broad range of situations that are supportive or obstructing mm -hmm. their ability to be educated. So there are some folks you, you can see the background, their house appears very quiet, very orderly. Other people are talking to me in just um, places that don't look like it would be very helpful for concentrating on your schoolwork. Um, people aren't using the bathrooms when they're meeting with me, but they're in their bathrooms because that's probably the only space that they can have um, privacy and quiet uh, to meet with me. So again, it's just real appreciation um, for their determination but also greater insight into the broad cross-section that our campus draws from. Yeah. And, and Kathy pointed out in the chat here that students are using their phones and working you know, all kinds of, uh, of shifts saying students are, uh, are ending work shifts right before uh, their 10.30 a.m. class. So again, that, that resourcefulness and the resilience. I think Camille just dropped the mic with her comments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Camille. Yeah. Um, yeah, if I might share a, a discussion post from a student, and this is something you know I never would have discovered about a student. Uh, they were supposed to reflect on, um, it's an, a, a segment about rivers and the power of running water. Okay, so this is what the guy has to say. What really interests me this week about this lesson are the videos about the flash flood because it gave me deja vu where I had a flashback to when I was living in an immigration camp where the location had a desert-like environment. It used to rain a lot, even though it was very hot and dry environment in the summer, which really didn't make sense to me um, as to why it rained that much. But at times floods did occur and they washed away our camps and belongings where we then had to rebuild everything. So yeah, I mean, it, um, that, you know, that's something I, I doubt I would have learned about that student unless I had uh, this, you know, moment to um, to find that out. Yeah, pretty wild stuff. Yeah. I, I want to share something on a on a little bit lighter but positive. I have, I, like I told you, I have a, a, a synchronous classes, and uh, the students are working in groups. And uh, the I have two back-to-back -back classes. And in, in each of the classes, I have to go into the breakout room of one of each one of the groups and tell them, I've got to let my next group in. I've got to end this Zoom session uh, because they're working together and they so value the time, the community that's been created in this class uh, that they have the opportunity to work day after class uh, to continue to communicate with each other. So, uh, you know, I, I, I am able to walk away so each one of those days thinking we are providing our students more than just the education. We're, we're giving them opportunities to continue to connect, to have community. We can do that. We can build those spaces. Thanks, Lisa. So as we hit the near the top of the hour, it's 9.57. I know that people will have to, to get off pretty soon uh, to do other stuff, uh, but wanted to extend a deep appreciation on behalf of the college for, uh, what do we got, 32 people still here hanging out with us. Um, appreciate 
the the wisdom each of you has shared, the perspective, the thinking that you've put into teaching and learning, uh, and most importantly, your commitment to our students. Uh, it's just uh, this was good for me personally to to hear your stories and our students' stories, um, and to really connect with what's really important, which is teaching and learning. Uh, it, it's just been a, a fun to to have this opportunity to engage each of you. Um, Elisa, parting comments. Oh, just always thank you all for being here and all the amazing work that you do. I so appreciate everyone. All right, well, uh, have a thank you so much for participating, everyone. Have a fabulous rest of your Friday and have a great weekend. Thank you. Appreciate all of you.